So, last few weeks, we've been going through um, chapters, selected chapters in uh, my new book that's coming out. Um, now, by now, it's the end of October. We keep moving the date. It's been a movable feast, but we're, we're on it. Um, and each chapter of this book takes a different topic. And the idea is to start with a traditional way that we look at this topic from a, a traditional Christian point of view, and then take a little journey with it, you know, put it through the, the meat grinder, and primarily look at this topic from the point of view of Jesus' teaching from a first century Hebrew Aramaic point of view, and then see what we come up with on the other side. And this process that each chapter takes, to my way of thinking and to, to my study of Jesus as a first century Eastern teacher, is exactly what he's prescribing to every single one of us. Every one of us has got to learn to think again. Every single one of us has got to become willing to let go of the things that we think we know so that we can become empty enough, ground level enough, connected enough to be able to be present to the truth as it really presents and not just as we think or expect that it should. And so we've looked at trust, and that was in the context of the free fall with the the skydiving story. We looked at love. You had me at hello. And we looked at, what was the third one? Ah, I'm going to forget now. Presence. And that was stars beneath our feet. So today, I want to take another topic. And maybe the best way to, to kind of hone in on this is to ask you all, what is it that you really want out of life? Yeah, I heard someone go, yeah, what is it that you want out of life? What is it that you want out of your spirituality? If you're sitting here today, it's because you're trying to seek for something, right? What is it you're seeking for? Do you have even a single word or a concept of what that goal looks like for you? Yes, what is it you're seeking? He wants to live in kingdom, okay? That means something to John. It may mean some, nothing to the rest of you or something to the rest of you. It may and probably does mean different things to every one of us. And that would go with any word that we say. I mean, we can fill in the blanks here. What do you want out of life? Do you want health? Yeah, that sounds good. Do you want wealth? Do you want relationship? Do you want family? Do you want love? Okay, good. Maybe, though, you're skewed more toward do you want fulfilling work? Do you want a cause? Do you want a purpose? Do you want a mission out of life? Is that what seems like is the best thing for you? Or maybe you're going to go all the way to the end product and say, what I really want is joy. I want peace. I want serenity. I want contentment. See, we want, if you think about it, we want all the things that we say we want out of life. But really, what we want is for those things to give us happiness, right? To give us contentment. To give us that feeling that everything is okay. And so whether it's wealth or whether it's health or family or love or whether it's work or purpose, what we're expecting is that those things are going to give us contentment. Those things are going to give us happiness. Those are means to an end. And what good are all those things, health, wealth, work, purpose, if they don't give us that sense of contentment, that sense of fulfillment, that sense of connection? How many people do you know that have a lot of those things on that laundry list that I just recited to you that still don't have peace, that still don't have contentment? See, that's the question. What is it that really gives us contentment? Because it seems like it's sort of a crapshoot. It seems like it's sort of the law of averages. That even if we have those things that we say we want on our list, whether we're really going to be content or not. A few years ago, and I don't know if you all know, but in this area, in South County, swallows are a protected species. Did you all know that? The little birds? They're protected. Don't mess with their nest, all right? Don't mess with the nest. They make those little mud nests and mess up your eaves, and then they piddle all over your sidewalk and, and you know, backyard and everything. But don't mess with the nest because they're, they're a protected bird there. So we had a next-door neighbor, and our, our, we were on a hill. So he was up, up above us, and we could look right up under his eaves, and a swallow started building a nest up there. 
And one day he just came along with a garden hose and knocked it down. And then here was this, we found this little chick, this little baby swallow on our grass in the backyard. He had come fallen over the fence onto our side. And it was still alive, and so we're thinking, okay, what do we do with it? So we took it and we put it in a little box with a, you know, paper towel on the bottom. And we didn't know what to do because we don't know anything about swallows. So we called around and we found someone who was actually um, swallow rescue. And, uh, and so we tooled all the way up to Huntington Beach, and it was just her house on some street in a, <laughs> in a residential neighborhood. And we walk in the front door, and there is nothing but cages. The entire living room, dining room, kitchen, everything is nothing but cages of all different sorts of animals, not just birds, but anything that was being rescued, and she was nursing back to health, and they had little IV bottles and everything. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, they had all... <laughs> They had all those stuff. So she was just like totally sold out. Her whole life was about these animals. And, um, and yet, the, the thing that she mostly wanted to know from us was, how did you get this bird? What happened? And so we told her what happened. And then she was absolutely incensed. She was inflamed. And she wanted the name and she wanted the address of this person because he was going to be reported by Grecky. She was so angry. She Never cracked a smile the entire time that we were there. And, and she was just brusque with us. It was almost like we were the enemy, and you know, she was the savior of this bird, and she just wanted to spit nails. And I'm thinking, here's a woman who obviously has an absolute passion for animals. She's living out her passion. Her whole house is converted over to her passion, and yet she is so angry. And it just didn't compute. It's like, what is this all about? You would think that with all those things in place, with her animals and her passion and all of this, that she would be content, but she wasn't. Now, I can remember back in the 80s. It looks like some of you can remember back to the 80s, too. But I remember back in the 80s, I was in my 20s, and at the time, I was just an absolute tree-hugging liberal. You know, save the rainforest, save the whales, you know, save the... Uh, McDonald's hamburgers, save everything. And, and I was just absolutely focused on the environment and on all these various issues. And I became a vegetarian for about seven years during that time because I didn't want to be part of the problem. And doing what I could, which wasn't much, but I remember being constantly frustrated, constantly feeling guilty, constantly ashamed because I was here as a privileged Westerner, white Westerner, and all of these third world countries were under this sort of attack and that sort of attack, and all these things were happening across the world. I mean, every time I turned on the tap water, I felt guilty, you know, because two thirds of the world couldn't do that. And of course, I wasn't eating meat anymore, but everything was looked at through the filter of that shame and that guilt and that frustration. I don't know that it actually graduated to anger for me, but I certainly wasn't content. I wasn't able to just be, right? It's, it's almost a cliche now that we know that health and fame and those sorts of things do not equal contentment. But it seems like a cause and a mission should, but it doesn't. Not for the swallow lady and not for me as a, as a 20-year-old. And how about politics? <laughs> how many of you have had a... Um, a family dinner just completely destroyed by a political discussion. You know, I see heads going up and down. You know, we had to ban politics at our extended family table for a while at least. Um, just look at social media. Look at anywhere where politics is now being discussed. People that are the most passionate about their politics or about their cause often tend to be the least content. They are the angriest. They are the ones who are always in that mode right? More deeply that they're involved, the less content they are. Even family and relationships, is that a guarantee <laughs> of contentment? As a counselor, I know how many people come to me talking about their family, talking about their relationships, talking about their marriage. They have these things in place that other people don't, but they're still not content. What we need to talk about is where contentment really comes from, not the things that may be symptoms or, or 
causes or, or effects of contentment, but where does the contentment come from? Because coming from the outside in, we never really find a reliable and repeatable way to live our lives in a contented manner. I want to take a little left turn here with you. Stay with me for a second. Last week, we talked about sand dunes. There's an interesting thing about a dune field. A dune field is always in motion, but it never moves. Do you ever think about that? You would think that here's wind blowing sand around, and it does it in predictable ways, and you've got the dunes that build up on the, on the upwind side, and then they drop off on the leeward side. They call it the slip face, and it does this, and it does that, and there's different types of dunes, and we can, we can map all of that stuff out, and geologists have. But you would think that the wind would just blow the sand, and it would just keep on going. Or maybe those dunes would just keep on marching until they reach the sea or something, right? But they don't. They stay in place like a lake or a body of water. Because what's really making the sand dunes possible, the dune field possible, is not the wind and the gravity and the, the, the friction. It's the bedrock topography that's deep underneath. There is a shape to the land down there in the bedrock that allows the sand to collect and keeps it in place. So every time you visit a dune field, it's different. But it's always right where you left it. The dunes march across, and it's almost like a, a shooting gallery. The dunes, they go down the other side, and then they come back the other side, and they just keep going round and round, staying in place. If we really want to understand sand dunes, we can't just be studying the lines in the sand at the surface. We can't just be studying the forces that affect the surface shape and movement. We need to go way down deep into the bedrock to find out what's really going on. And it's the same with contentment. We're going to need to dive between, beneath the surface details to these bedrock causes to find out what's really going on. Now, how do we do that? How do we get down to the bedrock? What about religion? Think religion's going to help us? Will that point in the right direction and get us where we really want to go? I'll tell you what... From my experience after 30 so years of, of doing this, is that uh, most religious people are about as content as most political people. And I don't know if that's been your experience as well. And it seems like the more religious they are, the more <sighs> invested they are in their religion, in their belief system, the less content they are. Now, this tells us one thing it tells us that at least religion itself is not the cause of contentment but it can help us to point in the direction. Religion focuses us on a belief system. It focuses us on certain practices and rites and rituals, on laws and ethics. And it creates a culture in us, at least in Christianity, where we have been taught to resist evil. We're supposed to resist evil. We're supposed to defend the faith. And the implication then from our religious training is that contentment comes from doing our duty within our belief system. Resisting evil, keeping the laws, keeping the rules, keeping the ethics and the standards that we hold, right? And defending the faith, defending those lines that we draw in the sand with our belief system. And defending the faith, defenders of the faith, and apologists, and those who are fixated on resisting the evil as defined by their church or their belief system. Do those people tend to be content? See, in my experience, those ten people also tend to be angry. They tend to be ones that are intolerant of other belief systems, other people coming at life and coming at, at spirituality from different directions. So where do we go to start to find out about what really drives contentment in our lives? How many of you have heard of the Desert Fathers? The Desert Fathers and Mothers. Okay, a few of you. Yeah. This is a group of people that is fascinating in Christian tradition. Dedicated followers of Jesus by the time of the 3rd and 4th century. This would be the late 200s and through the 300s and into the 400s. So the 3rd and 4th centuries into the 5th century. What was happening in the church at that time? The initial churches that Jesus' follow, first followers set up in, in the eastern Mediterranean basin were 
small gatherings. They met in people's houses. Um, they were a form of voluntary communism where everybody just brought their, their, uh, their produce for the for week and dropped it on the table and let everyone be able to partake. They, they were beautiful initial communities. But as they grew larger and larger and became more and more formalized, and most importantly, as they became more and more connected to political power, either within one of the hub cities of, of Christianity or eventually, by the time of Constantine in the early 300s, allied to Roman power itself, and eventually by the end of the fourth century, the state religion of Rome, all of these faithful followers, or I should say the minority, the, 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 the small group of really faithful followers are looking around saying, something is wrong here. Something is going on that isn't supposed to happen. This faith of ours doesn't make any sense anymore as it becomes more institutionalized, as it becomes more politicized. And so their solution was to exit. Their solution was to run from the cities and run from their villages and go out into the deserts of Judea and Egypt and create little enclaves for themselves. In many cases, the hermits, and this was the beginning of the monastic movement in the West, hermits lived alone in what they called a cell, which is just a small room that they lived in. But usually it was hermits that were connected to other hermits in a loose sort of confederation, or they became what they called Cenobites, which was communities of people living in that kind of environment. And the whole idea was to go out to the wilderness, to go out where all of the noise, all of the clutter, all of the the institutionalization of their faith was quieted. They go out into the wilderness, into the desert, which is sterile, and which is empty, and allow themselves to empty out of all the distractions that had been building up in their faith over the, the last 200 years since the crucifixion, and in themselves over the course of their lifetime, however long that was. And in that silence, in that space, to find what really mattered, to find out what their faith was really all about. And the legacy that they have left is fascinating, and it's so different from ours, so different from the way we look at our faith here in the modern West. And I wanted to read some of the stories, because the stories that they have left are giving us the character of their faith and the character of the way that they live together. And they're, they're short, and they're down home, and they're just right at ground level, and they get the point across in really interesting ways. Here's one of Abba Amanas, a, a disciple of Anthony. It is said that in his solitude, he advanced to the point where his goodness was so great that he took no notice of wickedness. He advanced in goodness to the point that he took no notice of wickedness. Now, to our ears, that sounds absolutely antithetical. That sounds immoral to us. Here's the story. Thus, having become a bishop, someone brought a young girl who was pregnant to him, saying, See what this unhappy wretch has done? Give her a penance. But he, having marked the young girl's womb with the sign of the cross, commanded that six pairs of fine linen sheets should be given to her, saying, It is for fear that when she comes to give birth, she may die, either she or the child, and have nothing for the burial. But his, her accusers resumed, Why did you do that? Give her a punishment. But he said to them, Look, brothers, she is near to death. What am I to do? And then he sent her away, and no old man dared to accuse anyone <laughs> anymore. What are we supposed to make of this? We who are defenders of the faith, we who are the resistors of evil, you know, no more notice of wickedness? How is that supposed to work? It runs against the grain of everything that we've been taught. We've been taught to resist evil. We've been taught to follow law. We've been taught to suffer consequences, to make penance, to make amends. All of these things are just being flipped around by violators of our moral rights, rules of engagement. But what they're telling us is that when you advance in goodness to a certain point, you no longer can see the wickedness in others. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Is it even possible that your goodness can cause you not to see wickedness anymore. But the stories of the desert fathers and the mothers are full of these kinds of incidents. Take a look at this one. There's a story of a hermit who was attacked by robbers in the desert. After being rescued by his fellow hermits, they rounded up the robbers and took them to the authorities in the nearest town to be thrown in jail. 
But then, after going and speaking with their abbot, the monks were so remorseful that they broke into the jail that night and freed the robbers. What the heck? One of the monks of Skidi committed a grave error, and the wisest hermit was called upon to judge him. The hermit refused, but they insisted so much that in the end he agreed to go. He arrived carrying on his back a bucket with holes in it, out of which poured sand. He said, I have come to judge my neighbors. And he said this to the head of the convent. My sins are pouring out behind me, like the sand running from this bucket. But since I don't look back and pay no attention to my own sins, I was called upon to judge my neighbor. The monks called a halt to the punishment immediately. When so deeply involved in God's presence to the point it displaces our notice of wickedness, how exactly is a person ever insulted or offended, let alone outraged? Abbot Anthony, the founder of the monastic movement and the father of all hermits, taught Abbot Amanus, saying, You must advance yet further in the fear of God. And taking him out of his cell, he showed him a stone, all right, saying, Go and insult that stone and beat it without ceasing. And when this had been done, Anthony asked him if the stone had answered back. No, said Amanus. Then Abbot Anthony said, You too must re reach the point where you no longer take offense at anything. The goal of goodness to these fathers and mothers was that we reach a point of unoffendability. That was the highest good for them, unoffendability. Get this. It is said that Anthony even came to the conclusion that the devil himself was not purely evil since God could not create evil and that all his works are good. So to Anthony, even the devil himself still had some good in him. <laughs> wow. Now, that may not square with your theology. You know, your skin might be crawling a little bit right now. But do you see the point that he's trying to make? That he's not offended even by the devil himself. But more importantly, do you see the attitude, the view of life that these men and women had cultivated in themselves that made such a statement even possible. That they could connect on this deep level. Abbot Joseph asked Abbot Pastor, tell me how I can become a monk. And the elder replied, if you want to have rest here in this life and also in the next, in every conflict with another, say, who am I? And judge no one. Who am I in the face of a conflict? What is he talking about? These fathers and mothers had gone out into the desert to find out who they were. Once all the noise had been displaced, once all the distractions had been taken out, what was left was who they really were. We need a reminder when we get triggered emotionally. We need to remind ourselves when we're ready to jump down someone's throat. What is my real identity? Who am I? Because who I really am at the bedrock underneath all of that sand is a common connection. We are all one in a way that we can't see because we're involved in the lines at the surface in the sand that are always blowing about, distracting us and moving, and we don't see how we're connected at the base of all things. Who am I? Judge no one. Become unoffendable. These sayings sound so alien, even immoral to our ears. But they speak of, of a level of connection, of identification that we can't even imagine. And in other stories, they speak of a level of contentment, a level of happiness and fulfillment that we can't imagine either. Do you think that's a coincidence? Coincidence? I don't think so. For these desert people, when identification with unity was full enough, it was almost impossible to regress or even recall the separation and divi division that used to define their lives. They had truly become new people. And moving beyond the standards, beyond the rules, beyond the traditions and laws that continue to separate and divide us, even separate and divide us in terms of good and evil, 
takes us into brand new territory. We're even resisting those who are living against our standards of right and wrong, we realize is working against our own contentment. I wanted to read just a little bit from the book. The end of resistance is the beginning of contentment. Think about it for just a second. The end of resistance is the beginning of contentment. It is so consummately human of us to passionately resist the very principles that would nourish the contentment we just as passionately seek every waking minute of our lives. Why is that? Because it's so much easier just to follow rules, to follow laws, to enforce standards, rather than really move all the way down to the bedrock connection between all of us and see what's really there and, and enter our moments that way. Because to get down that deep means we have to empty out everything that we think we know, everything that we hold dear, all of that programming, all of that training on those rules and standards. And that's a hard thing to do, one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your life. Contentment begins with acceptance it begins with our acceptance of God's deep, unseen lines and the relinquishment of our own on the surface, with letting surface lines be surface deep, constantly bending and wrapping themselves around each other in merciful embrace while remaining bound securely within the fields of God's love. Love always trumps lines. Any rule, regulation, or restriction written to preserve love only ends up preserving law if love is not allowed to break it whenever necessary to preserve itself. I know that's a mouthful. Any rule, regulation, or restriction written to preserve love only ends up preserving the law if love is not allowed to break the law wherever necessary to preserve itself as love within the relationship. For any of us trying to live the law of love, written laws won't be understood as absolute, but as a guidance toward making a loving choice in each situation. To understand this is the beginning of contentment, to stop defending lines and start blowing freely within the field of love, to watch our lines dance in the sand, to begin hearing the music to which they move is a pretty good definition of contentment. We can never follow rules into contentment. Contentment is about finding that deep connection, the identity at the bedrock, the common topography that holds everything in place, letting our lines in the sand just blow by as we stay rooted in the connection, in our place, like the dune field. Do you think Jesus would agree? Let's take a look. Just a couple of passages. And you can follow along in your inserts if you've got them, and Brandon will be right on it and get them up on the screens. Matthew 5, starting at verse, verse 39. I say to you, this is Jesus speaking at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. I say to you, do not resist an evil person. There's the magic word, went $100 right there, right? Do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, Go with him too. There it is. The end of resistance is the beginning of contentment. Don't resist that evil person. Don't notice or hang on to the wickedness that you see around you or even the abuse that you see in others. Or don't hang on to your own righteousness, your own sense of rightness, so that you deepen the division you deepen the separation that's already occurring between you and that other person. You're not going to be able to change the other person, but can you find the connection within yourself that leads you towards a path that may include, if not the reconciliation of you and the other person, at least in you, the release of all of your offendability, outrage, disconnection. This is where Jesus is trying to take us. Look at Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standards of measure, it will be measured to you. There it is. End of resistance, end of judging, 
those two main principles Jesus taught to these desert fathers and mothers, they turned them into a way of living life, and their stories reflect that living life. The two main themes, unoffendability and non-judgment, directly from Jesus. They both, why? Because both of those divide and objectify other people in our lives. And the discontent, the out-of-kingdomness is the result of that separation, that division. Look at Matthew 26, changing tax a little bit here at verse 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, oh, I skipped one, Matthew 22, verse 17. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? These are the Pharisees, these are the authorities trying to trap Jesus into a, a, a net that they think is inescapable. But Jesus perceived their malice and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Where is Jesus' anger? Where is his outrage? Where is his offense at the oppression of Rome on his people, which was so great that people were being crushed under the Roman boot? Where is his anger? They had their anger. Do we really have to pay these taxes as a people of God, as the chosen people of God? Are we supposed to do this? Jesus immediately takes it out of that place and puts it back into a balanced place interiorly. Yeah, this is the situation we find ourselves in right now. Give the things to whom the temporal power requires, but keep yourself free, available for God at all times. And the only way you're going to do that is if you're not giving in to the outrage, into the offense, into the resentment and the bitterness and the anger. Because once you've done that, you're not giving the things that you can give as a human being to God anymore. There is a balance. It's not about fixing the macro. It's about fixing the interior micro, which may eventually fix the macro, Matthew 26, verse 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother this woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For you will always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. It's the same lesson here, isn't it? Don't let the outrage of your cause, of your mission, make you miss or misuse your closest relationships. I always love what Mother Teresa said. It's easier to give a bowl of rice to someone halfway around the world than to give simple civility to someone in your home. You know, we can use those causes to keep us insulated, keep, keep us emotionally disconnected. It's safe that way. It's remote. It's the poor. And yet we can abuse the person right in front of us who's trying to connect. Jesus is trying to keep, create that interior balance in us. The contentment does not come from adherence to the rules, adherence to the cause, or for saving the world. It comes from a much deeper place. I finally got this in my 20s, my late 20s. Not only was I hugging trees, but I was trying to hug kids in Mexico. I worked for an organization that worked for the uh, nutrition and education of kids. And I remember it was so hard for me to go down to Mexico and help maybe two dozen kids, give them you know, lunches as they were trying to glean from the garbage dump what they were going to get to try to keep their households alive or eventually bringing backpacks full of school supplies and, and bringing food for the, the dining rooms and the Commodores. How many kids did I really touch? How many kids did I really help? And every single day, worldwide, 50,000 children died of malnutrition and vaccine-preventable disease. And I just couldn't square that in my head. I remember, I thought of it as Dodger Stadium full of kids dead that day when I went down and helped a couple of dozen. 
and it, it just, it was ruining my experience. It was adding to the guilt and the frustration, and I didn't know if I could can you continue doing the work because it just seemed so pointless. <coughs> and I know you probably all heard, you know, the old line about the kid throwing starfish. You know, the, the beach is blanketed with starfish, and he's throwing them back into the water, and the man comes and says, what good are you doing? You can't possibly get all these back. It doesn't mean anything. It means something to this one. And I finally was able to make that turn where it didn't matter what was happening outside of my ken, outside of my awareness, outside of my ability to help. The one right in front of me was the one that mattered. And I was able to make that turn, make that connection. <coughs> okay, see if I can do this. <coughs> the end of resistance is the beginning of contentment. Would Jesus agree? Absolutely, I believe that he would agree. For us to let go of this death grip on being right, being righteous, being the definer of good and evil, being the savior that comes in. <coughs> as long as we're holding on to all that righteousness, all that rightness, and that keeps us apart, us against them, in different camps, how in the world can we be content? You know, it's, it's, <coughs> thank you. Ah, I hate when this happens. You ever heard that old line about marriage? Would you rather be right or be happy? <laughs> Chew on that for a second while I drink. <laughs> I have a friend, and this was going. This is going back. <clears throat> right after I was ordained, you know, I was ordained in 2002, and right after I was ordained, <clears throat> I was like newly pasteurized. You know, the ink wasn't even dry on my certificate yet. <clears throat> I was brand new. You know, it hadn't hit my cell date by cell by date. And he was going through a terrible time in his marriage, and he had just found out that his wife was having this long-term affair, and it was devastating to him, just devastating. And <clears throat> I remember he was, uh, he, you know, we had coffee or had something, and, and he was just sobbing, and he just said, I wish she was dead. I just wish she was dead. I can picture her floating face down in the ocean. I just wish she was dead. And then he asked me, he said, I got to move out. You know, it's, just, it's not working. So he asked me if I would help him. <laughs> You're a brand new pastor, you know, trying to fit all these rules in place and, and be the good pastor. And, and, of course, in this very conservative evangelical church, we tried to preserve marriage, you know, no matter what. And here I was going to help him drive the truck and load his stuff and take him to his apartment. But he was my friend, so I did it, you know. Fast forward just a couple years, two or three years. He... <laughs> His wife had a child by this man. As soon as he moved out, she moved her lover in, and they had a child together. What do you think would have been my friend's reaction to that? What did he have every right to feel? But what did he do? He was carrying a picture around of that little child. He was like the great uncle that came over and babysat and watched and helped, and he couldn't have been prouder of that child. He even brought him to church a couple times. He couldn't have been prouder of that child than if he were his own. And Marion and I had dinner with him just a couple months ago, and nothing's changed. He still has a picture of him, except now the kid's going into uh, high school or college, high school, I think it was, and he was all excited about that, and he was going to see him do this, and he's in this sport, and he's in that sport. And all his friends thought he was absolutely crazy. And I was thinking, he's yeah, he's way down the co codependent road right now. What the heck is going on with this? But he was the one who was walking a few inches off the ground with a baby in his arms. So who is the crazy one here? He found a way to make that turn. He found a way to violate our moral rules of engagement in such a way that he found contentment. He found that sweet spot. He found that place. And this is what Jesus is trying to get across to us. What does it mean to be right? What does it mean to be righteous if you are miserable and you are forever living outside of kingdom? This place, this quality of life that our Father has for you, what is the point? The point is to live in that space, 
The rules are guides, and generally they are very good guides for us. But if we're not willing to break them, if we're not willing to violate them, if we're not willing to let our oppressors go free at times, just for us to interiorly be able to release ourselves and find our, the freedom of our contentment again, then we're missing the whole point. My friend was able to let go of his lines in the sand, his rightness, his outrage, and found a new kind of family that nobody could understand. But he could, and his ex-wife could, and her husband could. It was something that worked for them. As long as we continue defending what we think our faith is all about, as long as we continue resisting, then we are defined by distinction, by difference, by division. And how in the world can we be content if that's who we are? Defending lines blowing in the sand is exhausting work. Contentment comes from the bedrock that is common to us all. Now, does this mean that we never defend lines at the surface of things, that we never enforce our laws or enforce our rules, that we, never punish, that we never punish offenders? Of course not. That's not what we're saying. What Jesus and what the fathers and mothers and what my friend are describing is an inward attitude toward the injustices that life presents us. That that wickedness that I find in you is the same wickedness I find in me, in myself, how do we row out of these waters together in our little boat? You see, the bedrock shows us that we're all connected in exactly that way. It's not that we don't deal with the wickedness and the abuse that we see and protect people that need protecting, but that we keep ourselves in that connected position so that even as we do, we maintain our own balance it's an internal balance that we strike, that even as we protect, even as we punish as needed, we stayed anchored in the bedrock unity that holds us all together. And in that way, we can be happy warriors, even as we do the things that we need to do in life. We can nurse baby birds with a smile, and we can continue to love even the one who destroyed the nest. We can be civil, we can be connected, there is no contentment apart from this. No rightness, no righteousness, no obedience, no defense, no resistance will make us content unless it's rooted first in the unoffendability of true connection, true identification. One last bit from the book. Contentment is like a sand dune. It will utterly disrespect and disregard any lines we draw to define its shape and scope. Anything we think it is, expect it to be, or try to create will simply blow through our fingers as it swirls over the next crest and down the slip face beyond. Contentment plays by no rules we can write down and constantly violates the ones we do. Rooted and bounded only by the shape of love, the topography deep down under the sands. Contentment moves about, marching and dancing in the breath of God's wind, appearing random only until we learn to see it with our Father's eyes. The field is always full, always changing, always in motion, but always silent and still as well, the snapshot of a single moment. There is no anticipated destination and no clinging memory and contentment. It always was and always will be, and we can only enter it from its endless middle. We can ride the dunes of contentment like slow-motion slow surfers on nearly frozen waves. We can release our lines and allow love to dictate the motion of our lives in ways that violate all our rules of what is and what should be. Or we can hold our ground, defend our lines as the dunes march on by. But whatever we choose, the wonderful thing about dunes is that there is always another one coming right behind the one that just passed, always another crest behind the present trough in which we find ourselves. No matter how many dunes we let past, we can always catch the next one if we're simply willing 
to let go of our lines in the sand and blow freely about on God's breath in the infinite field of his love. And here's the challenge, or the other way of looking at contentment. Contentment never comes from reinforcing distinctions. It is the sensation of the release of personal boundaries, of becoming unoffendable. That's where Jesus is trying to take us. That's where the fathers and mothers are leading by their example. That's where we need to go if we really want to find what we really want out of life. Let's pray. Oh. Father, something that should be so simple is so elusive, and you know that. You spent so much time trying to show us what it really means to be connected and contented in your kingdom. Help us once again to not just want contentment, but to be willing to take the steps toward contentment, which is a completely different thing. Help us to get up and walk toward, do the things that seem risky, the things that seem distasteful, the things that violate everything that we think we know in favor of relationship, in favor of connection that will show us the truth that we can become convinced of. Thank you, Lord, for giving us everything that we need to do this. Thank you for loving us. Never let us forget. We can only love in return because you loved us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.